Well, hello. Is that loud? My voice tends to carry, so I'm not even sure if I actually even need a mic uh, based on what my friends tell me. Um, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, this is kind of interesting because, um, well, basically, I, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, decided to take on something that apparently uh, I've been told might be impossible to do. <laughs> so that's a little scary. <laughs> but um, I knew it would be a very, very difficult problem and not completely solvable. Um, but I've been very, very curious about this problem for multiple reasons and uh, decided to take it on. And so basically what I started was figuring out how to code a tool that would be kind of like a developer's tool for testers, basically, um, with a core piece of that uh, being a tool that would provide some sort of assistance for generating page objects. Um, and uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, I've learned a lot and come up with some creative ideas uh, on how I believe this can be done. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, my name is Paul, as you can see, and I'm from the Portland Selenium Users Group. Uh, currently, I'm a contractor at Nike in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, I've been a contractor at a couple different places and full-time employee. I've worked at a number of different companies. Um, generally, the companies I've worked at, their main line of business is not software development. Uh, it's usually something else, like selling shoes or... Um, um, marketing info or some such thing. Insurance once did that too. Um, and this talk is um, one that I presented uh, last October at the Portland Selenium Users Group, of which I'm an active member in. And uh, it basically presents my findings of this tool that I've written. And um, um, well, well, we'll go from there. So what sparked this project of mine is um, with the kind of places I've worked, I've found um, the issues, uh, a lot of issues I've encountered with writing Selenium is typically I'm the only one who knows how to do it. And everyone else is too busy. Everyone's curious, they want to learn, but no one has the time. Um, frequently, uh, I'm surrounded by manual testers uh, who are good at what they do, but often lack the programming skills. Um, I'm curious, how many people have, have encountered that situation, maybe in their current jobs? Wow, cool, okay. Um, uh, how many have, or work with QA people who have some programming skills, but don't know anything about Selenium? Okay, probably the same group. And. Um, uh, a, a last thing that sparked, that motivated me was as I got more and more into page objects, I found writing locators to be really tedious sometimes. Okay, it's not interesting. The first time you do it, it's like, wow, that's really cool. And then you use a CSS locator, it's like, wow, that's really cool. And then you do a couple more, and then you get a tough one. It takes you maybe 15 minutes to figure out that you have to do an nth child or something. It's like, wow, okay, that was kind of cool. But then it kind of, you know, after you've done this a few times, it's no longer interesting. You're ready for something new. So I, I figured, you know, why, why not, you know, maybe a computer can do that for me. Um, so I start asking that question. Can't a computer do some of that? Um, some of my motivation also goes back from the Selenium IDE days, uh, which I had used. Um, when I first learned Selenium and um, immediately was frustrated that I couldn't reconfigure the code that it generated. That was back when it was spitting out Selenium 1. But even with the Selenium 1, I had some, kind of some special needs. I said, well, I, I want to, you know, shouldn't, there should be a template under this. And I found myself trying to debug the, and step into the, the old IDE code and found that next to impossible um, and gave up on that. and decided to go down this path. And what is this path? Well, basically, what this tool does, which is a working tool, um, it um, 
goes, hits a website, you, you give it the URL as a command line pram, it goes out, hits a website, brings in the DOM for that page internally in memory, parses that DOM, cycles through all those nodes, and for whenever it hits an HTML tag that you have pre-decided that you want some Selenium code for that tag, it goes ahead and spits that code out. Like, okay, well, what code would that spit out? Well, you, the user, get to choose that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I kind of wanted to give sort of an overall summary. Um, I'll hit on some of that as we go. So what I've found is the answer is yes, you can generate um, um, some of the Selenium code, but there are, is some tr obviously some tricky questions um, that <laughs> come about with this problem, as you can well imagine. So, and I'll mention a couple of those. Um, okay, so if you're going to do this, you know, do you want to generate all? Can you do it, it? Can this be completely automated? Well, no. Um, you, the tester, needs to make some decisions here. And so what I decided to allow the human to do is um, the human can decide which UI elements will be accessed by Selenium. And I've got a couple of ways that that can be handled. Um, the human can decide which locators to use. So maybe you just want to do everything with IDs. Uh, maybe you want to use IDs and CSS selectors. Uh, some teams use class names, some don't. Uh, my current group at Nike, although I've got IDs and CSS selectors, they're talking about using very custom attributes because they use IDs for some other things sometimes. So um, I'm making this, or I've made this tool flexible to account for that. Um, uh, also, uh, certainly you want to decide which uh, Selenium language you would use out of the four supported languages. So. Um, the goal, this tool will gel generate compilable and useful page objects. So I don't know if I'll be able to, de if I'll have enough time to demo that, but if anyone wants to catch me in the hallway later on, I can show you some that I actually have on my machine here. So the tool could, given a URL, it will generate Selenium code for that page in a page object format. Um, it will allow different configurations for user-defined generated code. Specifically, the, I guess I've mentioned this a, a moment ago, the user specifies the generation language, the user specifies which HTML tags generate the code, the user specifies which locators to use. And I'll show you uh, in a bit how that's done. Um, here's another problem I had to solve, symbol names. For your member names within your page object, and your method names, okay? Uh, what should I do with that? Just generate some arbitrary ones? Well, no, I decided to do that intelligently. So um, I use the HTML tags text, if there is some. Um, I also use attribute values. And if I have neither of those, I generate the symbols using kind of a, a generic default. So. And symbol names are unique within the generated page object as they would have to be. So. Um, what about the page object's class name? Um, at the moment, I'm taking that out of the title tag and that's been working for me. Um, I'll probably be open to other options on that one too as my project grows. Uh, at the moment, it's still just a prototype and um, that's what I'm using. Um, multiple ways to, config to configure the output, um, you know, basically to choose what gets generated, okay? Um, and I'll talk more about these as we go on, but basically I've got code template files. That's where you get to choose what language you want to generate. Uh, command line params for various things, particularly for uh, choosing which locators that you want to uh, have generated. And then this thing that I'm calling an analysis file for picking and choosing out which ones you want to generate. It's sort of like an intermediate step. And uh, the goal of this analysis file thing is um, to support a future GUI. Um, right now my tool is command line.
space. Um, and my goal is to get this thing running as an engine, stick an API on it, and then put a GUI on top eventually. So. Okay, so the code templates. What you do with these things is you specify uh, code snippets that are parameterized. And they're parameterized on um, the member name and the method name. And they're parameterized on, um, um, well, basically that's it. They're, they're parameterized on where, oh, excuse me, they're parameterized also on the locators. So the locators, the member name, the method name are parameterized. Um, aside from that, you write this template in whatever the language is you choose, okay? Um, you also only specify these code snippets for the HTML tags that you actually want to automate. So if, for example, you don't care about divs, you don't include them in your uh, template, your code template, okay? If you do want divs, you put it in. So here's an example. Um, it's actually a working example. This is the one uh, I use for anchor tags. And... Um, uh, I've got some delimiters in here. Uh, this could almost be any string. It's just kind of what I chose. I may change it later. Um, I haven't necessarily decided I needed to use XML for this file. I figured I'd just keep it kind of straight, you know, ordinary text. Um, and then I put actually a comment line in here that would get generated. And then I've got my find by. And this is the parameter. It's kind of a, you know, a hook for where the locator will actually get generated. Okay. The locator could get generated as an ID. The locator could get generated as a CSS selector. Um, my tool supports both of those right now, and uh, uh, I can very easily add in class names and uh, name attributes. Um, I just haven't put that in, in the project yet. Um, but they would, they would just be a copy of how IDs are handled. Uh, and then wherever I need a symbol name, um, I just use this little indicator here, okay? So this is not meant to be XML or anything. It was just happened to be the delimiters I chose to use. Um, I could have changed it to asterisks if I wanted. Um, I haven't decided what works best there yet. Okay. So, but for prototype purposes, this has been working for me. Uh, and then the method code block. Um, again, I use the same symbol as part of the generated method name. Okay. Um, same for the return statement. Um, and I could have as many methods here as I want. Uh, it, I chose to do a get link text in this case and a click method. Um, this could be in Python. I just happened to choose Java because that's what I write my tests in. Um, but um, I haven't, um, uh, I don't really know Python really to test this out, but I am designing my app here um, so that it can be um, code agnostic. Um, so for that matter, you could do Visual Basic in here for QTP if you want. <laughs> <laughs> So that would be an interesting experiment, actually. But I'm not ready to go purchase a QTP license to try it out. <laughs> um, so command line params. Um, basically, these are, I've got a few, uh, a few working and a few others that I've got planned, but uh, the most important ones right now, at least for the purposes uh, of, of the moment, is the URL um, and a destination parameter which gives it the location uh, where I want the page object to be generated. So, for example, if you already have a, a test project running in Eclipse or IntelliJ or something, um, you can just, you know, you can run this tool to generate the page object to the location on your hard disk of where um, your, your project files, your test project is located. Okay. That should be fairly straightforward, I think. Um, 
here's another feature that I'm developing, uh, command line params uh, for specifying your locators. And so basically right now, I think I mentioned a moment ago, um, the locators I'm currently generating are IDs and CSS selectors. Um, the IDs was not difficult, the CSS selectors was fairly challenging um, and was kind of a fun little algorithm to write. Um, but that appears to be working for me um, in, in the testing that I've done so far. Um, and um, the framework is in place enough that I can pretty easily add in names and class names. Um, I haven't decided if I will take on XPath yet. I don't know if people still use XPath much. I know the Selenium community used to really try and steer people away from XPath statements. But um, I believe the algorithm I'm using to generate CSS selectors could probably be uh, adapted to do XPath, I imagine be a little more difficult because XPath syntax is a little more complex. But um, so, Okay, so here's kind of an issue that uh, I learned um, as I was going into this. So, um, so for example, one of my uh, test beds that, I use, uh, that I've used a lot while I was generating this app is CNN.com's homepage. And uh, as you can well, well imagine, that changes frequently. Um, it's, there's a lot of, it's a very large, complex page. And that was actually why I chose it. Um, but, and my, my tool works great on it. Problem is, is it generates a lot of information. It's a huge page object. So I said, oh, okay, well, would that, what would, would this still be better than having to code it up the page object for that homepage by hand? Um, so it, you kind of have the reverse problem. Before, you had to code the page object up by hand. Now you generate it, but now you have to go through all that code and delete out all the stuff that you'll never use, right? So um, um, this um, tool has a tendency to generate too much information. So I, I decided I needed some solutions for that. So the very easy way, remember that configuration file I just showed you with the code in there? Uh, certainly don't put code templates in there for tags that you're never gonna care about. Okay, so that's kind of the very first easy way of filtering out, you know, um, if you're never gonna deal with H3 tags, then don't put any code snippets in it. The, my tool will just run right past those H3 tags and never generate any code. Um, the other solution I decided was what I'm calling this analysis file. And uh, what you get with this analysis file is at the moment a text file, okay? And um, it has information on each tag it found, the locator it would use to find that tag, the attributes that that tag uh, would have if it has any, you might say, well, why is that useful? I can just get that out of the page source from the browser. Well, yeah, you can. But that's sometimes hard to read because you're sifting through, if, if you don't care about divs, for example, you're sifting through all those divs and stuff. You're sifting through the whole DOM. What this analysis file does, it's already filtered out only the tags you care about, okay? And it's digesting the information into a nice little format that's a little more easy to read, okay? Um, and so what you do with this analysis file, you then kind of run down it, and you're, you're only looking at the tags that you know you're gonna care about. You kind of run down it, run down it, and you say, oh, well, oh, there's another, there's an H2 tag I thought I might need, but I don't need that one. So you ignore that one. Oh, here's one I do want. And so you just uh, splat it in the text file. Like, I, I think I, right now I'm using an asterisk just before uh, that particular record. And then you kind of, you know, splat the ones you want. And so then for your generation step, you uh, rerun the tool, this time against the analysis file, and it now only generates the ones that you want. So that's the solution I've come up with right now. Um, I think, I, I believe it'll work. I'm, I've almost completely implemented that. I've implemented the analysis file. I now need to go implement the generation piece but um, that's just going to mean having another little module that sits on top of all the generation code I've already written. So, 
So I'm, I'm probably a couple weeks away from um, having, having that complete. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so I just I mentioned this. So this roughly is what's in the analysis file. And um, this talks about the second pass. Again, why would you want this thing? Well, eventually, what I would like to have is a GUI or a web app that takes this analysis data, and rather than giving you a text file, it loads it all up in a, in a very dynamic table, and you go, rather than putting a splat in there, you go ahead and hit checkboxes. And then you hit a button to generate, and it's spitting out what you want. So, um, you know, with a GUI, you know, I, I could maybe, you know, have, you know, little pop-ups or drill downs for more information. You know, there's a lot that could potentially be done there uh, in the future. So, um, let's see. Here's an example of an analysis file I generated last time I used it. <laughs> you see I've got some pretty hideous nth childs in there. Um, that just kind of demonstrates that I can do that. <laughs> if I need to. Um, I think it also was actually a bug, which I've now fixed, um, in that um, I was uh, generating nth childs in some cases where I actually didn't need to be. So um, this is actually a great example, though, showing div nth child 47. I mean, that's really over the top. But um, have any of you uh, written um, uh, test automation for apps that were developed using GWT? Okay, um, my experience with that is it's div after div after div after div after div. Because all the HTML code was generated from those libraries. So, so um, that can happen. Um, and I had IDs and stuff in there from the developers too. But even then, um, it tended to lead to some crazy CSS selectors at times. Um, let's see. See how I'm doing on time here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you have a way of saying if, if it has an identifier that's useful, I don't have to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's a very good point. I, I think I had that on my original slides, slides from last October. Sorry, there's a hierarchy that I choose here. Uh, in how I generate locators. That's a very good point that I've forgotten about. I'm so used to looking at this thing all the time. Um, I take IDs first. Um, if I've decided I'm going to use names, um, I would I guess I think I would do names second. Uh, class names third if I decide via command line pram that I'm going to generate class names. Fourth CSS selector. Um, and again, uh, this analysis file can lay all that out and show you, hey, you've got an ID. You know, you can, you know, hey, you don't have an ID. You don't have any attributes at all. You're, this is the locator you're going to get. So, um, th this analysis file right now, it, it was, it's, again, this is also prototype level. Um, it it's, it kind of gave me what I needed to do to, to prove the concept and then move forward. The next thing I wanted to prove to myself. But um, there's a potential for, for putting all kinds of useful information in this thing. So. Um, testing my generator. Um, this is now my latest piece that I'm focusing on. Um, uh, well, I, I should caveat that. So when, while I was developing this, I wanted to have some crazy websites uh, to, to read in. Um, as at least a beginning test bed. And so these are the ones I chose. Um, I'm a news junkie. Um, and so I was using CNN and ABC News and BBC a couple times. And then I started thinking, you know, I need something other than a news website. And I thought, why not state.gov? And uh, I looked at their page source, and it was pretty hideous, actually. Um, and uh, so that's one I've used a lot also. And at one point, I, start, I, I actually uh, practiced Spanish. Sometimes I go to Spanish conversation groups, and I thought, I thought, hey, you know, why not start thinking a little internationally? This this thing should work on um, a, a foreign website, and it actually did. I, I googled Spanish news and uh, ended up taking an Argentinian one, and uh, it, the app didn't crash. It it, it uh, 
parsed all that and generated a page object for me. So, um, but that's not a very controlled um, test situation, right? Um, what I really need, and I'm going to give credit to one of the guys in the Portland Users Group who gave me this idea, a guy named Ryan. I wanted controlled tags. Here's a div with no attributes. I want to see how my app works on that. Here's an H1 tag with no attributes. Okay, maybe here's an anchor tag with a gazillion attributes. Okay, um, here's something with a name only tag, uh, no ID. Here's something with a, you know, and I mean, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of permutations there. And I don't expect that I'll ever be able to test all of them. But I think if I, if I think about this very carefully, I can probably test a lot of them, certainly, you know, commonly encountered ones. So um, what I've started doing, and I'm just at the beginning phases of this, but um, I set up the infrastructure on my laptop here so that in my project for the Selenium generator, um, I've got in a resources folder um, a page, an HTML page, actual HTML page, where I'm just going to be putting in very controlled tags and attribute combinations. Okay. Then what I did is I installed Tomcat on here, and I configured Tomcat to redirect uh, localhost slash my test pages into my projects folder where that test page is. So now I can take my Selenium generator here. For its URL, I pass in localhost slash my test pages. Um, that goes out. Um, you know, via the HTTP pro protocol, Tomcat picks it up and sends back to my app um, that test page. And then my app goes ahead and processes my highly controlled HTML tags and attributes. Um, so that's basically where I'm at so far. Um, and if we, I don't know if a demo will actually work up here or not, but if we get time, I, I, I can do that. Um, still got a little bit of time left. But let me uh, at least make sure I finish up on um, kind of status of where I'm at. You know, you've kind of seen, you know, I've explained what I've done. Um, here's what I need to do next, what I hope to accomplish, say, within the next year. Granted, I'm doing this on my own free time. Um, I want to write. Uh, a bunch of those test pages that I just described. Um, I want to finalize the command line configurations. And adding to that is I also intend to um, allow this to be configurable via an XML file, uh, which would also imitate the command line prams so that you don't have to have you know, this big, long, crazy command line. Um, uh, finish the analysis file work and get the generation working off the analysis file. I, I believe I've written all the code for that. I just haven't tested it yet. Um, whoops. Um, and then this is going to be an interesting one. And I've given this a lot of thought right from when I first started developing this code. Is a single page object, well, that's all kind of you know, fine and dandy, but that's not very useful. Wouldn't you want to take on the whole site at the same time? If you're going to generate, let's generate, right? So um, what I would like to do is crawl a website and generate all of these. And uh, I believe I will be able to do that uh, given the modular way that I've designed my code. Um, I think that's basically just kind of adding on another little mechanism in there. Um, what I will take on first will be uh, uh, crawling the links on a website and generating the pages behind those. Um, you know, dealing with forms and submit buttons and stuff will be a lot more tricky. I'm not quite sure how I will resolve that one. Um, probably we'll have to parse JavaScript or some such thing. Um, but um, um, at least in terms of the framework, in terms of kind of, you know, the design of, of the engine itself, um, the first piece of that crawling I will take on will be the links. So, um, and finally, a to-do I'd like to accomplish within the next year is I would like to turn this into an API. Um, command line interface, calling an API, 
once I have an API layer, then that will be like the next step to hopefully putting a um, um, GUI on top of it. So, so. Okay, and here's the real tricky to do. Some of you, I'm sure, are out there thinking about this right now. What about iframes? What about JavaScript? <laughs> um, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm very interested in the problem. Um, I haven't had a chance to explore these yet. There's been so much to do with this, this prototype already. Um, but um, I do intend to research those. So um, I'm kind of curious. Anyone else have any ideas on some tricky to-dos that I'm not even thinking of right now? Yes. So the, the, uh, the names that your, your tool picks from the source? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you were going to feed in the name. Mm -hmm. Those names would be, you know, archaic names. How do you, you know, there, there could be an OK button, but in the source it's, you know, XG97 or whatever. How do you, how do you that? Uh, Yeah, I do sometimes get stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Well, let's see if we can get the questions, then maybe we can take that on, because, or it, it, certainly afterwards. Um, I think the analysis file would be one way of taking that on. That's also information I can show. This is what your symbol's going to be. Okay. Um, you know, when it gets to GUI level, then you could edit that right in there, I suppose. Uh, of course, now it's becoming less automated, right? But, um, um, you know, it'd be one way around it. Um, like I said, with those symbols, I grabbed the text first. So if there's text, I grab it. If there's attributes, I grab it. Uh, if there isn't, I get a generic. I just call it UI element number, and if it happens to have processed 50, then I get 51. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, future goals. Um, open source. I have not open sourced this yet. I'm the only one working on this, but if anyone's interested in helping, um, I'm not, uh, a near, definitely not opposed to uh, putting this out there and uh, maybe getting a team to work on this. Um, if I don't hear much, then I'll probably continue to work on this myself and continue to develop it and maybe uh, revisit that next year. Um, but I'm not in GitHub yet. I do have this in a, a uh, SVN repository that I actually can have for free one other user uh, connect into that. Um, but if anyone's truly, truly interested in helping with this, I'm happy to, you know, share source code. Um, but probably only for, at the moment, probably only for anyone who's really serious about helping out. Um, but, um, yeah, so, and so here's my contact info. If you're interested in this at all, please contact me. Or if you want good Portland Brewery recommendations, feel free to contact me also. Um, and uh, on that note, uh, I'll take questions and your comments and stuff. So, because I think you could have a more robust, like you called it an analysis file, but you could really use it sort of for hints and have more of a like a more of a, a descriptive grammar on how to find things, and then when you find them, how to name them. Because like you have one where you say, "Go find all the A's." Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Maybe we can just call that article. So, you know, there's some sort of delimiter that says. Right, right. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right, and that's where I'm going with that analysis file. And it's so. you can do something where if you have CSS, if you embed CSS, like you used to say, per particular section, because in other presentations we've seen, they've actually gone the opposite way, which is because you're paying coding it, Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right. Well, yeah, and actually, I like your idea of calling it a hints file. I might, if it, I might borrow that and change that name if you don't mind. Um, but uh, and another problem there that I've thought of is um, typically you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence of a, a page object class corresponding to the whole page, right? Most people use page components. You know, they subdivide a page. So I intend to use that file to have a way of indicating that, hey, split here. Split here, split off a different page object. 
split here, split off a different, you know, split here and end here kind of thing. And I, I think that should be doable. And so. I've thought of that, yeah. I like the way you described that, but yeah, I, I re realize I will not be able to do everything with this, and I have no desire to try. <laughs> yeah. Mm Yeah, well, if it does the routine stuff and leaves the more interesting stuff, like the Ajaxy stuff later, then it generates a, a very wor a highly working shell, you know? And I think that would be a good value add, you know? Because who wants to be coding locators for all the, the header text, you know, and stuff like that? Um, so so I, I, think there, I, I think there's something valuable here. Uh, I think it remains to be seen how much. <laughs> um, um, you know, it's just a prototype, but it does appear to be working for me. So, any other questions? Yeah, Noah? Are you using, so are you using this right now, I guess, like, in, in production, so to speak? No, I wish, not yet. I, I hope to, within the year. I think I'd like to get that, that web crawling piece done first. So, um, I, I wouldn't use it where I'm currently at, at Nike, uh, partly because the project I work on has a big giant canvas right in the middle of it. Um, but uh, if possibly with my next job change, I might bring this in and start this from scratch. So, so. anybody else? Uh, the question was for dynamically integrated IDs. What, what do you mean by dynamically integrated IDs? How can you use that in the page object anyway if it's changing? The ID needs to be static. Yeah, I, it, it, when I've encountered that in the past with my experience, if the, if the ID is not going to uh, be the same between builds of the AUT, then I can't use it. So. Well, then I would use a CSS selector. So. So I dealt with that on an internal tool that I worked on at Nike, on my first contract at Nike, where there was no IDs, they had class names all over the place, but those were generated by the GWT. And um, I was told that those generated class names, although I could see they weren't changing, they said if they upgraded the version of GWT, um, then those class names very well could be different, so don't count on them. So. Like what? Like flex? Uh, I won't deal with flex. <laughs> so, there was another question? Yeah, uh, GTX we had in there, actually. It was causing a lot of difficulty. So um, I, it looks like we're about four minutes over. So I appreciate your time and your questions, and thank you very much. Thank you.